Good morning. I'm going to pray for us this morning, and then we're going to jump into uh, I am Jonah again. So let me let me pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word. Father, for the way that it continues to speak to us, to change us and challenge us. And, and Father, my prayer for us this morning would be that that would be the case. That Father, as we we so often come to passages that we've read and we've studied and are, are very familiar with this Lord and. Uh, there is this, this possibility that we can just go through the motions. And Father, we pray that that would never be the case for us here. That we would hear your word fresh each time. That that would hear what you're saying to us now in this moment. And that, Father, you'll stretch our thinking, that you'll transform our hearts, that we'll become more like Christ through an encounter with your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You ever have a story uh, that you hear that's sort of unbelievable until it comes from somebody you know? I had one of these stories years and years ago. It was my brother. As many of you know, I've got a twin brother, and my, uh, my brother had been serving on a beach mission. Does anybody know what a beach mission is? Have you heard of these? Right, so beach missions run by Scripture Union. And they basically, the way a beach mission works, for those who don't know, is a group of people will form a team, and straight after Christmas, they'll, they'll camp in a caravan park, and they'll, they'll live and, and eat and do ministry out of tents for the community in the caravan park. And word had got around that, that, they, my, this, that as my brother and his team were at this caravan park in Yurunga, word had got around that this big storm had been moving up the coast. And as it had been coming up the coast, it had been wiping out different uh, beach missions. The tents had been blown over, they had to reset everything up. And so the team got together... And they prayed. And they prayed that the Lord the Lord would protect their sight. As they're praying, my brother opens his eyes. I know you're not supposed to open your eyes in prayer, but he opened his eyes in prayer. Right? He opens his eyes and he sees around the campsite where the beach mission is that it's rung with men in white. It's angels. If anybody else had told me the story, I wouldn't have believed it. And then in this moment, he, he, he goes to turn to somebody, tell them, and the vision is gone. The storm comes up the coast. He goes out to sea, goes around the beach mission, and they're spared. What a great story, hey? Who wouldn't love a story like that? So often we hear stories and we hear stories like that and we think, that's the story I want, that's the sign I want. If I just had something like that, that would convince me that Jesus is real, that he's calling my life, that I orient my life around him, that, that would give ourselves fully to God if we just had a story like that. So what is oh, I'm still here. Uh, what would happen? What, what sign would you need? What would Jesus need to do to convince you that is real, and that they convince you to orient your life fully and completely around him, to follow his lead, to follow his example, to listen to his teaching, to obey him in every way. What would, what would need to happen for that to happen for you? What sign? What would do it? It's an age-old question, and in Matthew chapter 12, we have this moment where some Pharisees, some religious leaders come up to Jesus, and they have a question, and they're demanding a sign. They're saying, we want something, we need something from you, we're asking something from you. Now, whether they're sincere or not, that's an utterly different question. But it's an age-old question, is it not? That we want something that will just convince us, that will remove that shadow of doubt that, we, that all lingers for all of us at different times. And so Matthew 12, 38, 39, we, it was read for us a moment ago by Melissa. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Jesus said, his teacher, we want to see a sign from you. He answered, a wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. So what sign of sign, type of sign are you looking for? What would convince you to surrender your life to him? So the Pharisees come and they're looking for a particular sign. They're asking for something. They're saying to Jesus, if you would do this, then we would follow you, obey you, be convinced of who you are and what you say. Because in, in Luke 11, when this same story is told, just before, they're actually saying it's by, by Satan or Bezeb, Bezeb, 
Satan, <laughs> right? <laughs> I was going to say it's too early in the morning. I've got, I don't have an excuse, do I? Because it's an hour later. But nevertheless, it, they're saying it's by the, by the devil or Satan that Jesus is doing what he is doing. And so I'm not sure that they, they're going to be convinced about him. But they, nevertheless, they come to him and they, they, they don't want to run of the mill miracle. They, they want something that's going to do it for them. And what does Jesus say? He doesn't say, hey, what do you need? How can I answer that question for you? He simply says, no. Not going to do it. Perhaps he knows that no sign will be enough, that they're not really open at all. So listen to what he says. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented of the preaching of Jonah, and now something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to listen to Solomon's wisdom, and now something greater than Solomon is here. Now, the question is, who had more information to go on, to be a catalyst for change, a catalyst to, to give themselves fully to God? Those in Nineveh? The queen of Sheba, who basically just heard of the wisdom of Solomon and, and trekked all the way to Jerusalem to hear what he had to say, or Jesus' contemporaries. Jesus' contemporaries had far more to go on. They've seen the blind being healed, so they can see. They've seen the lame walk. They've seen the leper cleansed. They've seen the deaf hear, the mute speak. They've seen all sorts of maladies cured. They've seen miracles performed. They've heard Jesus teach like nobody else has taught before. They've got more than enough to go on. They just weren't getting it. Have you ever heard of a thing called uh, selective sensory perception? Selective sensory perception is the way our brain works that, that it, when information comes your way, you decide what information is relevant and what information is irrelevant. You might be doing that right now, going, this is totally irrelevant, right? It's, it's, it's a way that we cope with all the information that's coming our way. Without selective sen sensory perception, we would not survive. I, every morning, just about, I go to a cafe, a cafe to, to start my day. And without selective sensory perception, I would not survive because I'll be trying to work and I'll be like, I can hear a barista, I can, I can hear the grind of the coffee, I can hear the, the, the steaming of the milk, I can hear that conversation over there, I can hear the click of the machine over here. I, it, without, and what happens is my selective sensory perception filters out saying, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant. Right? But if somebody's sitting opposite me and talking to me, I'll go, relevant. So my, our brains are all the time making decisions about information that we consider to be relevant that will let in and information we think that is irrelevant that will push out. It doesn't always work. Anybody ever been hit by a ball in the head or been hit by a ball? Right? I can guarantee you that ball came from the same place as the ball that hit me in the head. Nowhere, Right? You're going, where did that ball come from? That came out of nowhere. And what happens is often if a ball, if somebody's throw a ball at me now, um, usually I'll catch it because I know that I've got to do something that sometimes though our brain is going, not relevant, not relevant, not relevant, oops, relevant, too late, right? <laughs> the selective sensory perception doesn't always work the way that we want it to. I remember at uh, our church on the Gold Coast there, there was a time we had this guy come into our night service and I got a chatting to him afterwards and I discovered he was an atheist who loved going to church and picking fights with people after services. And so he, he, uh, we, we sat down and he chatted, he raised some questions and then I would say, oh, what? have you read this scholar or have you thought about this? And his answer was always the same. Oh, I've read that scholar. Don't find them very convincing at all. And I don't think he actually read all those scholars that I kept quoting. Because right? he, had, he had a selective sensory perception. He was saying, I don't consider anything that you're saying, anything that would convince me, anything outside of my particular worldview as relevant. So I would disregard that. As, uh, he would say, it's un unconvincing. I don't believe it. Your argument was weak, whatever the case would be. And anything that reinforced his particular worldview... Like that was convincing, that was relevant, that was truthful. 
Earl McManus, in his book, uh, The Way of the Warrior, makes a similar observation. He says, your mindset filters out information that disagrees with your view of reality. And if it doesn't filter it out, it distorts it to conform to your view of reality. The thoughts that your mindset allows you to move quickly through to your conscious mind are the ones that reaffirm already held beliefs and convictions. So Jesus' contemporaries, they had enough information. They just filtered it out. They're saying, hey, we, we, we can see the lame walk and the blind see and the deaf hear and the mute speak and the leper cleansed. We know that he's teaching like nobody else. We've, seen, we've heard about the miracles. We've seen all sorts of fever and illness dealt with. We, it's all there. But they just filtered it out and found it utterly unconvincing. In contrast, Jesus says, hey, look at Nineveh, that pagan, violent city. Jonah comes and they get it. A Gentile queen, she hears about the wisdom of Solomon, this Jewish king that's got wisdom from God, and she gets it because they're not filtering it out. And maybe it's meant to be offensive because if you're a, if you're a religious leader in Jew, Jesus' time, you think you've got it. You, you, you're meant to understand the ways of God. And, and here is Jesus saying, you're not getting it. You want a sign? I'm not going to give you a sign. In fact, you, in implications, you've got more than enough. Nineveh had more than enough. They got it. Queen of Sheba got it. These pagan Gentiles get it. And here you, you don't seem to get it. And why don't they get it? Because of their heart, their mind, their selective sensory perception. See, sometimes if, if you're a Christian and you're trying to explain your faith to somebody, you think, oh, I, just, I need to explain it more clearly than just not getting it. Or I need, to, I need to live a more compelling life. Sometimes it doesn't matter because their head or their heart or their perception or the worldview is just filtering it out. It doesn't matter what you say or what you do. It's just a reality we find ourselves in sometimes. But if you're checking Christianity out, sometimes the honest conversation is sometimes we filter things out that we don't want to hear even if we know they're true. And that's the reality that is going on here. And see, the root of the problem is not the message. It's not the lack of signs. It's, it's their unbelief or unwillingness to be swayed by anything or anyone. And so Jesus says, you won't get a sign. But you get the sign of Jonah. Which sort of says, what is it, Jesus? Are they getting a sign or not getting a sign? And what he's saying is, you want a particular sign. You want, you're asking me to perform for you, to, to tick a box. He says, I'm not going to do it. Because the reality is, you've got more than enough already. But there is going to be a sign. And you're going to have to deal with what this sign is. This sign is going to raise particular questions for you. And it's a sign of Jonah. And if you, understand, if you want to understand God, I'm going to spend the rest of our time just looking at, at just an outworking of this particular sign of Jonah. If you want to understand God, if you want to understand his call in your life, then maybe it's looking for not the sign where God's going to give you your angel story at Yurunga, or the sign that you would like to utterly convince you, but maybe it's to listen to what Jesus is saying here to the Pharisees and saying, hey, we've got this sign of Jonah. What can you learn about me and my heart and my activity? And how should that influence the way in which you understand me and the way in which you live? And so it raises the question, what is the sign of Jonah? Or well, Matthew 12, 40, we're told the sign of for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of huge fisher, fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So it's, a, it's a Jesus' death and resurrection. It, it's pretty clear. On, on a very superficial, cursory look, that's, that's what it is. In John 2, 18, 22, in a similar incident, Jesus actually refers, use the imagery of the temple, but to a similar question, in John 2, we're told, the Jews then responded to him, 
What sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. They replied, it has taken 46 years to build this temple and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words that Jesus had spoken. See, John gives us insight into how this works. I, I, when Jesus said this originally, I don't think anybody's necessarily thinking of death and resurrection. They're probably scratching their head going, there's something going on here. They're trying to figure it out. Only after he's d- died and resurrected, they, they actually get it. But what he's hinting at is they know the story of Jonah and what happens in Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2. Where there's this great storm that comes and Jonah has his moment, arguably his finest moment, where he says there's a storm coming and is threatening to take the life of all these pagan sailors. And he has this moment where he says, I will sacrifice myself so the storm will be checked and they will be saved. It's a story of sacrifice. It's a story of love, if you like. It's a story of salvation. And Jesus says, that, that is the sign that I'm going to show you. We're told in Jonah chapter 1, verse 12, this is the the incident. Jonah says, pick me up and throw me into the sea, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. He's saying, sacrifice me and you will be saved. And Jesus is saying the same thing. I will be a sacrifice so that you will be saved. And in that respect, he's like Jonah. But in so many other respects, he's totally unlike Jonah. Jonah was cast out for his own sins. Jesus was cast out for our sins. Jonah almost dies. Jesus submits himself fully to the wrath of sin and death on our behalf. Jonah could actually care less about the people. And by the time we get to Jonah 4, we actually see this. We looked at this uh, last week. He sits by the edge of the city and he can't wait for punishment to come on these people. And yet, what we find in Jesus is that prior to his, his being arrested and crucifixion, he sits by the edge of the city and he weeps for it. He has compassion for it, knowing that they will persecute him and insult him and ultimately kill him. Tim Keller, in his book, The Protocol Prophet, makes this observation. He says, Jesus is the prophet that Jonah should have been. Yet, of course, he's infinitely more than that. Jesus did not merely weep for us, he died for us. Jonah went outside the city hoping to witness its condemnation, but Jesus Christ went outside the city to die on a cross to accomplish its salvation. And when Jonah is thrown overboard, and what Jesus is hinting at is arguably the central theme of the Bible. That's why this this sign is so important. It's sacrificial love. That's what's going on here. It's utterly countercultural. When we learn something about the nature of love, we learn something about the nature of love because what we see in Jesus is epitomized in Jesus. It's a self-giving love. It's saying, actually, I'll put my needs aside for the sake of another so that they may benefit from my action, so they may know love, so they may know salvation. It's a central theme of the Bible. And Jonah gives this sort of foretaste of it, and Jesus says, oh, what, what Jonah hinted at, this is what you'll see me doing. In 1 John three sixteen. John simply puts it this way. This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us and we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers and sisters. Now that word love, I'm sure you're familiar, for me in Greek there's all sorts of different words for love. It's not talking about friendship, it's not talking about romance, there are different Greek words for that. This is agape, this is what's often referred to as a God-type love. It's it's an act of faithfulness and commitment. It's an act of the will. John Stott says of agape love, it means self-sacrifice in the service of others. If you understand what Jesus is talking about, the sign that he wants to do for us and demonstrate for us and perhaps invite us into, he's saying, hey, this is what love looks like. 
It's self-sacrifice in the service of others. That's what you're going to see me doing. If you want to know what I'm about, if you want to orient yourself around who I am and what I'm about, he's saying, look at the sign of Jonah. And you'll see the central theme of the Bible played out in that particular story. As the Gospel of John says, it's preparedness to lay down our lives for others. It's what Matthew is alluding to here in the sign of Jonah. And it's utterly different from so much of love that we see in our culture, is it not? Tim Keller, again, in his book, The Prodigal Prophet, says this, one of the greatest contrasts between our Western culture and Christianity comes exactly at this point. Our society defines love basically as a transaction for self-fulfillment. It is a market-based definition. You stay in love as long as both of you are profiting from it. Now, is Keller right? I think sort of. I think he probably overstates it a bit. You know, I, I, I think love can be more noble. It's not just Christians that can love a particular way. I think people were made in the image of God and have the capacity. But you get his point, don't you? The point is that Jesus is inviting us to an utterly different way of loving that is self-sacrificing in the service of others. He's the ultimate Jonah who shows us what love looks like. It's sacrifice. And it's not love expressed for my advantage. It's love expressed for the advantage of the person who is the object of my love, the one who is the recipient of my love. That's what we're talking about here. Now, in a similar vein, Jesus talks about greatness being countercultural. So I want to jump out of the Jonah story and just jump into another story in Matthew. And it's almost this comical story. But again, Jesus is picking up on a similar theme about what is great in his kingdom. In Matthew 20, 20, we have this moment. The mother of Zebedee's sons came to Jesus with her sons and kneeling down, asked a favour of him. Now, Zebedee's sons are uh, James and John. Okay? They're referred to as the sons of thunder, right? which sounds impressive. We don't know why they were called the sons of thunder. You get the impression that they're sort of probably fiery and, or big or there's something about them that Jesus said, hey, I'm going to give you guys a nickname, right? It's not like we're going to call you Irwin or something like that. It's like we're going to call you sons of thunder. That's who these guys are. And then we have this story that their mum comes to Jesus. And what goes on, they come to Jesus and Jesus says, what is it you want, he asked. She said, grant me one of these two... Sons of mine may sit at your right and the other at your left in your kingdom. You know what you're asking, Jesus said to them. Can you drink the cup I'm I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and my left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my father. Then it goes on. When the ten heard about this, they were indignant with the two brothers because they beat them to the punch. It was often indignant when somebody asks something and gets something that you wanted. Jesus called them together and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for for many. So James and John have this ambition. When Jesus comes into the kingdom, the sons of thunder want to sit in positions of prominence in the right and left-hand side of Jesus. And so what are the... I I love this story because what do they do? The sons of thunder send their mummy to talk to Jesus, Right? And so, Mommy, can you go and talk to Jesus and ask if we can have the right and left when he comes into his kingdom? And and she comes, she says, I have this sort of simple request. When you come into your position of authority, when you come into your kingdom, can one sit on your right, one on your left? I don't mind which one. You can decide, Jesus, but just like one on your right, one on your left. Ever had like a mum or a parent that just thinks you're the bee's knees and wants to make all these audacious requests on your behalf? Or you know somebody like that? It's sort of like this, you know, here's their mum and, they, and, and, and she thinks, hey, my boys should be the ones. And so she goes up and it's sort of embarrassing, except what's more embarrassing is they're there. They're actually there because what happens is she makes this request 
And you can imagine seeing they walk. She, he's like John and James' mummy walking up to Jesus, and she sort of gets down on her knees and makes this request. And here's Jesus, and he actually doesn't reply to her. We told he actually talks to them. Right, they're right there behind her. And this is what he says: You don't know what you're asking. Can you drink the cup I'm going to drink? We can, they answered. Jesus said to them, You will indeed drink from my cup, but to sit at my right and left is not for me to grant. These places belong to those for whom they have been prepared by my Father. Do they know what they're asking? Yeah, of course they do. For them, they want positions of greatness. So when you come into your position, we want to be great in your kingdom. Now, what's really, really interesting, Jesus doesn't say, hey, stop the conversation about greatness. We shouldn't talk about greatness. That's the wrong conversation. He doesn't actually say that at all. Sometimes we read passages like this and we think Jesus is saying, don't aspire to be great. Don't aspire to do anything with your life. That's not how Jesus responds here. Listen to what he says. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. He's not saying don't become great or don't aspire to be great. What he's not doing, though, he's not replacing greatness with servanthood. Sometimes we think greatness and servanthood are polar opposites. It's not what he's saying at all. He's saying, what's great for me in my kingdom? You achieve greatness through servanthood. That's how this works. Jesus is saying greatness is not found in your, in your fame or your position but it's found in being a servant. It's not found in the applause of others. It's not found in your fame. It's not found in your position. It's found in what you do for others. That's what greatness, being a servant. You don't become great because of what you do for yourself. You become grateful because of what you do for others. That's how Jesus answers this question. It's utterly countercultural. What's a servant? A servant surely is someone who engages in self-giving, self-sacrificial love in the service of others. It's a central theme of the Bible. When they ask about what is great, Jesus said, this is what's great. One of my heroes is um, my grandfather, Gordon Leslie Nay. Yesterday was the third anniversary of his passing. And, and, uh, and I can say, unashamedly, my grandfather had a great life. And uh, he had a good life until 50-ish, but then he had a great life after 50. And the reason was this. Around about the age of 50, he, he'd, he'd done fairly well in business. He was, a, I think, a general manager of a steelworks. And his daughters had grown up and he decided that he would have a crack at running a lighting business. So he gave up, he took, got his savings, started the business, moved here to Northern Beach and started a lighting business. And it went, and it went off. And he made a lot of money over the next several years of his life. But that's not what made his life great, because there are plenty of people on the Northern Beaches who have plenty of money who do not live great lives. What made his life great was this. Last year was my grandmother's funeral. And I was standing outside St. Kieran's down at Manly Vale. And this man walked up to me. And he said, I, I want to introduce myself. I'm from the rural fire service. And I can't remember which district it was. And he said, I couldn't make your grandfather's funeral, but I wanted to come today. He said, a few years ago, we were out of money and we, think we, we thought we had to shut everything down. And I went and saw your grandfather. And he gave us some money and he got us going again and he basically saved our organisation. And I thought, I've heard this story so many times. Different organisation, a different individual, person after person after person who would tell me, our community centre was going down, we contact your grandfather, he got some business people involved, they turned the thing around and rescued our community centre. The Manly Bed Race to raise money for Manly Hospital. He organised that, do money for Bear Cottage. He did all these things that were for the benefit of others. 
for me. That's what made his life great. It wasn't the money that he amassed, it was what he did for others. And then in 2015, so much to his delight, he got an OAM for what he did. He turned a good life, I think, into a great life because he was a servant. I want, to hear, I want you to hear this. If you might get to the point where my grandfather got, you might think, I'm living a good life, but I want to live a great life. Take heed of the sign of Jonah. Take heed of what Jesus says about greatness here. The difference between a good life and a great life in the kingdom of God is will you be a, be a servant? Will you sacrifice your needs for the sake of others? Or will you be a servant to others? And what I love about my grandfather's story, it wasn't the first half of his life that was great, it was the second half of his life that was great. No matter where you are in your life, it can become even greater if we take heed of what Jesus says about what is great. And you know who lived the greatest life of all? Jesus. Now we're in church, we're supposed to say that, I I get that. Why did Jesus live the greatest life? Because I don't think there was any greater servant than Jesus. And in Matthew, again, 20, 26 to 28, he says, whoever wants to be first must be your slave, just as the Son of Man, that's him, did not come to be served, but to serve and and to give his life as a ransom for many. There's no greater servant than Jesus. There's nobody made a greater sacrifice than Jesus. It's a central theme of the Bible. Greatness is marked by sacrificial love. That's the benchmark. If you want to live a great life, you need to choose and serve the way that Jesus did. And I think the sign of Jonah is more than just a benchmark, though. If we just think this is just a benchmark, then we miss the point. It's it's not just inviting us to live like Jesus, to look at his example, his supreme example of sacrificial, self, self-giving love, but also to understand what it is that he's done for us. In Matthew 12, 40, we're told, For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. That's a sign of Jonah. right? Not simply to move us from a life of sacrifice to servanthood, but to awaken us to the reality that Jesus is the ultimate Jonah. He wasn't just thrown into the sea to save a few sailors. Jesus actually threw himself into death so he would save us from a greater peril. He was thrown into the ultimate storm of divine wrath for sin and death to save us from them. And that's what we remember when we actually do what we're about to do now, when we do communion. We're actually going to roll straight into communion today. Because communion is about what God did for us. This is a sign of Jonah. The one who would let sacrifice himself in self-giving love to rescue us. So the sign of Jonah is not just the great example. It's the great exchange. Where he exchanges himself for us. And so we're told that on the night that he's betrayed, in Matthew 26, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he'd given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples. Take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, drink it from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. See, Jesus is the one who knows the storms that we go, that we endure, and it's the story of the God who came into our storms, into our pain, and offered Himself as a substitution for us, so that we can have life. And I reckon if you get that, it should humble you, and it should inspire you. That's what the sign of Jonah ought to do. It's what communion reminds us of. It should humble us and recognise that, hey, he did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He lived the life and then he sacrificed himself. He threw himself into our storm, into our pain, so that we might be rescued.
because we couldn't do it. We couldn't check that storm in and of ourselves. Only he could check the storm that we find ourselves in. But it should also inspire us to say that, that's a great life. That's life that I want to live. I want to be a servant. I want to be known by that self-sacrificing, self-giving love in the service of others. That's what I aspire to. Just pray for us. And as I do, just reflect on the sign of Jonah. That God, you, your life can become a great life, not just a good life. He, Jesus has done enough to, to convince you of who he is. He's shown you what God is like and he invites you to go and to live likewise. To live a life of sacrificial, self-giving love. To live a life of a servant. And not just live good lives, but live great lives. Let me pray for us. Father, this week, in whatever context we find ourselves, give us the opportunity to start to be servants. To express your love to people in very practical, tangible ways, in word and in deed. And Father, we pray that our lives will be littered with stories not of just what great people we are and the ways in which we've served people, but we littered with stories of how people got to know you and saw your love and experienced who you are through us simply joining you in the activities that you have for us. Father, help us to live great lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.